All right, we're moving on to angular momentum. So this is the analog of linear momentum, but now we're talking about rolling. Um, this is another one of those chapters that you know, tends to be a little bit confusing for people when they encounter it the first time, so I encourage you to really sit down and spend some time with the material. We're gonna start with wheels and rolling. Um, when you have a wheel, um, you, you probably are, you, you, you probably, imagine it as if the wheel is is slipping on the on the surface of the road but actually the way that you want your real wheel to operate you want your wheel to stay um, to not slip relative to the road road so that as it turns it rolls out um, and it's actually the the surface of the the wheel is um, is at the point of contact is not slipping at all. And this is why you want tires that don't slip. You want t tires that have a lot of friction with the road so that they do not slip. Now, of course, we've talked about friction. Friction says when you have friction, um, there is a limit to how much static friction you have because the wheel is, you want the wheel not to turn relative to the road. You are considering static friction, not kinetic friction. And that gives you the upper limit for how much static, the, the mu sub s gives you the upper limit for how much static friction you can actually have in a system. Uh, so when you have a wheel rolling, you may have, you have some force pulling the wheel forward. You also have gravity acting on it. You have the normal force, which acts directly at the point of contact between the wheel and the, um, and the road. And then you have friction. Now friction, it depends on which, uh, which way you're going. If your wheel is rolling forward, then the friction is acting in the, uh, the friction, uh, in the friction in that case is acting forward because it's keeping the wheel, um, the wheel from slipping. Um, it, it is actually helping make the wheel go forward. Um, so if you have a wheel which is not slipping, um, then it rolls out um, as it rolls along. Um, the, it's in constant contact with the surface of the road. So if we want to describe what's going on with that wheel, um, you have, uh, you can talk about its angular acceleration as well as its linear acceleration. Um, and we quantify the acceleration in terms of the motion of the center of mass. So you have the acceleration of the center of the mass and the velocity of the center of mass. Um, and you also have an angular rotation relative to the center of mass. Um, and this is saying the um, angular velocity is equal to the velocity of the center of mass divided by the radius. The angular acceleration is equal to the acceleration of the center of mass divided by the radius. Um, and that comes from the fact that the um, distance traveled is going to be equal to the angle times the radius. So then your first derivative, if you, let me actually put this as x and not d so that the equations look a little bit neater. x equals theta times the radius. dx dt is equal to d theta dt times the radius or omega times the radius and the second derivative with respect to time is equal to the second derivative of the angle with respect to time times the radius or alpha times the radius and this is equal to the acceleration and this is equal of the center of mass and this is equal to the velocity of the center of mass so if you guys are still Learning calculus, you can skip over that, but that's the basic idea. All right, so then you can describe this system as having both a velocity of the center of mass, a translational velocity of the center of mass, as well as a rotational velocity of the center of mass. When you are considering uh, equations describing the energy, you have to have both the translational energy as well as the rotational kinetic energy. Um, and you also, uh, if you're considering the, um, if you're considering the, 
the equations describing the kinematics of the situation. You have one, um, one set of equations describing the, um, describing the translational motion and one set of equations describing the torque and the rotational motion. Um, both are valid at the same time, so you can have problems where you have to actually solve both. Okay, so then, um, yeah, so this is showing if you have a wheel rolling from, uh, from A to B, um, and this, is, this has the um, going in this direction, so you roll with the wheel until it comes up and A rotates from the bottom point all the way up to the top. Um, you roll out an arc length that is, the, that is this distance d. That is equal to the radius times the angle that, it, that the wheel rotates through. When you have rolling without slipping, um, so this is what, if you're driving a car, riding a bicycle, this is what you want to happen. You want your wheels to roll without slipping. Um, and then um, you don't, um, if you have rolling without slipping, that is when you are, you know that x equals the angle you pass through times the radius. If you have slipping, you actually can get the angle, more angles, the, the object rotates more than this. Um, but if you have rolling without slipping, you have a fixed relationship between the, um, between the distance traveled and the angle um, that the, the wheel goes through. So here you have a cylinder rolling down an inclined plane without slipping. Uh, it starts at rest. Um, and here this is using the coordinate system that we use for an inclined plane where x is lined up with the plane. This arbitrary choice, which I have no reason to override, um, has it pointing down the ramp. Now, when we have, uh, we have the same forces we always had, we have, uh, we have gravity. And actually, I'm going to try to draw this. All right, so the total weight is like this, but the figure has it broken down into the coordinates along the x-axis and the y-axis. So you have um, some component of gravity acting in this direction. That acts on the center of mass. And then you have gravity acting, you have a, you have a force of friction acting um, in this direction. That is going to act to, um, that is going to act exactly at this point um, so that you do not have, um, and it's going to exactly counteract so that you don't have slipping um, at this point. And of course, this component of gravity is exactly counteracted by, um, by this normal force. So now we have to figure out our equations of motion. And we have both. Um, translational motion and rotational motion. So we can write down that the, um, the net force, in the, well, first of all, let me just write the vectors out just to, be in good, to, get in, to stay in good habits. So uh, the force net is equal to the normal force plus gravity plus friction are the weight of the of the ball is m g sine theta x hat. I'm going to switch from y hat to x hat because I, I just like x hat, y hat, and z hat better than i hat, j hat, and k hat. Minus m g cosine theta y hat, and then our um, then we have the normal force has to exactly cancel out the y component of gravity. So this is n, uh, n equals mg cosine theta y hat. And now here with friction, we're not at the maximum kinetic, uh, we're not at the nat maximum static friction. So we actually don't know the amount of static friction. What we know 
is that it is acting in the negative x direction because it's keeping that wheel from slipping. So we write friction equals negative lowercase f x hat. And then I can write my total force is only in the x direction because by construction I made the y component uh, zero because the, the ball is not rolling off of the inclined plane. So my total force is mg sine theta minus friction. And that is equal to m times the acceleration of the center of mass. So I have left this, this um, variable, this is a variable, because I don't yet know friction. Now, I also can write the torque. So I have um, force, torque is the analog of, um, of acceleration, linear acceleration. So I have an equation which says that the torque is equal to I center of mass times alpha center of mass. And here, because I have rolling without slipping, I know that A center of mass the magnitude of A center of mass equals R times alpha center of mass. Now I have to figure out my torque. I am rotating about the center of the ball, and what we've assumed, and I think there's, this is the assumption in all or almost all of the problems even in the, in the chapter, we're assuming the center of mass is right here at the center of the ball. When that happens, because torque equals r cross f, you have no torque due to gravity because gravity acts on the very center of the ball, which is also your axis of rotation. So your only torque is going to come from friction. And this is r. Our r is always going to be in the negative uh, y direction, and it's always going to have a length of the radius of the ball. So it's negative r uh, y hat. Now, the force of friction is equal to negative f x hat. Now here, bear with me because you're seeing the mirror image, so I have to actually use my left hand for the right hand rule so it looks right to you. Um, so now I'm going to take R cross F. Now I need, let's see, R cross F is into the board. So I actually can move my F up so that it's a little bit easier to see what I have to do for the cross product. I line my palm up with R, and I curl my fingers in the direction of F, and my thumb then points in the direction of the cross product. So my torque is in this direction. It is pointing at U. And I want to figure out um, my at z-axis, I'm going to line my palm up with x, rotate it toward y, and it points in the direction of um, it points in the direction of the um, of the z-axis. So that is towards me. When you guys look at it, you see it like that. You look it, so it's pointing towards me, not towards you. Okay. So now that's my z-axis. Um, so my torque is in the negative z direction, and then I can tell, I can write my total equation for the torque, which is negative r f z hat, which is equal to r alpha center of mass, which I now know is in the z hat direction. So now I can take the scalar version of the torque, which says 
that r, the magnitude, ah, uh, ah, uh, and this I should have my negative sign because we decided it was in the negative z direction. R f equals R alpha center of mass. I have a unit problem here. My unit problem is right here. This should be I, not R. It's a moment of inertia. So this is RF equals negative I center of mass alpha center of mass, and this guy is I center of mass. I think it's useful for you guys to see where I'm making dumb mistakes because it helps you work out the reasoning. Um, I noticed here that I have a, a unit mistake in this equation, so I went back to check until I could fix the units. That's also why it's useful to leave things as variables until the very end. Okay, so Rf equals I, I alpha. Now, I can solve this and say F, well, I can do this a few different ways. I can take this and write this in terms, I think I'm going to write this in terms of the linear acceleration. So the linear acceleration is equal to alpha center of mass, or sorry, is linear acceleration is equal to R alpha. So alpha of center, center of mass is A, center of mass, over R. And now I can rewrite this, that the force is equal to I center of mass over R squared times A center of mass. Now I want to point out the units here. The moment of inertia has units of mass times radius squared, and I'm dividing by radius squared. So I have this has units of mass times acceleration, and that is equal to a force. So here I have units of force. Here I have units of force as well. So I know that at least my answer has the right has the correct units. Now I'm going to plug this in here. So that I can solve for um, my center, my acceleration of the center of mass. And I get mg sine theta minus I, I'm going to drop the center of, well, I center of mass, R squared, a center of mass equals m a center of mass and i can rearrange this m g sine theta equals m plus i center of mass over radius squared times the acceleration and I solve this. I'm going to erase some of this here so that I have a good place to write. And mg sine theta, or sorry, at, we'll start by solving for the acceleration of the center of mass is m over m plus i center of mass over radius squared sine theta. Or I can rewrite this as 1 over 1 plus i center of mass over m r squared sine theta. Okay. When we did not have any uh, rolling, we just had something sliding down. Um, I should have a G. I dropped my G here, right there. Another time when units save the day and make me catch my stupid mistakes. The difference between you and me is not how many stupid mistakes we make, it's how easily I catch them. All right, so 
Now this has units of acceleration, units of acceleration. This quantity right here is unitless. I like writing my answers in terms of unitless quantities. It also can be easier to tell when you, when you get, after you've done a few hundred physics problems or a few thousand, you start to get a feel for how to write, uh, write problems like this. And if you write it like this, it's more obvious what, uh, what's going on physically. You can look at this equation and tell what, um, what the system is going to do. So here, if I have something that has no center of mass, so I'm, I can treat it if like I have a particle at the very, very center, um, so when it rolls, it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't, it isn't hard to get it rolling because it's all of the mass is at the very, very center. I have no center of mass. I get back to my equation when I had something just sliding down the, um, sliding down the inclined plane. The acceleration is equal to g sine theta. What this term does is it actually, so anything, any non-zero center of mass is going to make this term uh, is going to decrease this term. So any non-zero center of mass is going to slow the ball down. That sort of makes sense because you have the same, if you go from the top of the inclined plane all the way to the bottom of the inclined plane, you have the same amount of energy in the system except now you're starting to put some of the energy into rolling instead of simply putting the energy into sliding down the inclined plane. So then you have, uh, so that tells you, first of all, you get back to the same answer that you had before if you consider the case when there's effectively no rolling because there's no center of mass. And rolling does what you expect it to. It, it slows things way, way down. We also can take the other limit where we flatten our inclined plane out. You, you expect that the acceleration is greater when the inclined plane is larger. So uh, sine increases with theta. So this uh, acceleration is going to increase the more that angle is increased. This process, I recommend that you do this, that you at least start developing this skill when you're doing homework problems. Look at your answer and ask yourself what your answer is actually telling you the system does. Um, that's gonna help you develop your physical intuition for what how things should behave. It also is gonna help you catch dumb mistakes. Um, sometimes you will look at these answers and you will go, wait, that doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand this rolling stuff I don't understand you know, why my answer doesn't make sense. Sometimes you still have the right answer, but your intuition is just wrong. But when you have those cases, it's a good idea to double check the math and make sure that you've done it right. And double check with a friend. I very strongly recommend as you go through introductory physics that you form study groups and check through all the problems because they're, it's very easy to make a dumb mistake. You can tell, I do it all the time myself. All right, so that's the general procedure when we have rotations like this that you're going to have to consider both the, the torque and the net, the net torque and the net force. So, this is a lot of equations to erase off the board here. This is where Zoom has some advantages because you just click a button and it all erases, but that also means that I can go a lot faster. That makes it harder for you guys. All right, this is then when the wheel is slipping. When the wheel is slipping, you still have all of the same, you have a very similar, um, you have a similar force diagram. Um, here, I actually, I actually think I'm gonna go back and do this one with Slipping, so we still have the net force in the x direction is mg sine theta and then minus friction, except now we know what friction is. Um, then here we have 
this is equal to m a center of mass. Here, our friction is going to be equal to mu sub k times the normal force. The normal force is equal to m g cosine theta. So, in this case, we can solve the for the um, we can solve for the angular the, solve for the linear acceleration moderately easily. We have m g sine theta minus friction. Oh, and now I can plug the actual equation in for friction. Mu sub k m g cosine theta equals m a center of mass. I can eliminate my m's. And I am left with a center of mass equals sine theta minus mu sub k cosine theta all times g. And I grouped it like that so it's obvious that this has the right, um, the right units. So this is my linear acceleration. Now, I also have a torque. And my torque is equal to I center of mass alpha center of mass, which is equal to I over R A center of mass. And this is equal to friction times R. And this is now equal to mu sub K M G R cosine theta. Ah, I made a mistake right here. I no longer can make this conclusion because I, I this, this statement because I no longer have a linear I no longer have a linear relationship between the angular acceleration and the linear acceleration. But I can say what the angular acceleration is. This is equal to mu sub k m g over I center of mass R cosine theta. Okay, this one is a little bit trickier to figure out to get some feel for what it should look like. Um, I can plug in a couple examples. So if we have um, the mass, if we have a hoop rolling down the hill, then the center of mass is equal to m r squared. And in that case, my angular acceleration is equal to mu sub k m g r over m r squared. So I get mu sub k g over, ah, and I drop my cosine theta. Boy, today my mind is just running all over the place. When I teach a physical class, I give my students candy for catching me in stupid mistakes. Because it keeps my, to make sure that I don't leave them on the board. I don't have that advantage right now. Okay, so. The acceleration is mu sub k g over r cosine theta. So it's accelerating. Th this, is, um, this is in the case that it's a hoop. That's the largest mo um, moment of inertia possible. And it, the, this torque is just going to get it. Um, th this has units of uh, meters per second squared. So this now has, so G over R has units of meter, of sec, one over second squared, which is the right units for the uh, angular acceleration. So what goes on in this case, um, 
and this is just for a hoop, you actually could plug in different moments of inertia, but I wanted to plug this in so you see what units it has and roughly what it looks like. What happens in this case is that the ball, um, the ball rolls with the same acceleration as if it were just sliding down the, 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 um, sliding down the ramp, but the friction, instead of just dissipating energy and going into the heat, the friction is now um, making the ball rotate too. It's just that sometimes that, that that ball is also slipping at the same time that it's rotating. And here we know the exact magnitude of the friction because um, so the static coefficient of friction gives us the maximum value of friction that we can have. The kinetic, um, when you have kinetic friction, you always have some fixed amount of friction. So you can see that if you have a smaller moment of uh, inertia, you get somewhat smaller rotation as well in this particular case. And the linear acceleration when you have slipping doesn't actually depend on the shape of the object. As long as, well, so if you had two different objects at the same time, and they all had the same friction with the surface, then they'd have the same linear acceleration. It's just that, um, that the, one, the ones that have a larger moment of inertia would get going faster, would be rolling faster. All right. That also applies when you are um, considering a wheel rolling. What you ideally want to have if you're driving a car is that the wheel is not slipping. What you, um, what you may have is that you may have a combination of, rota of rolling and slipping. Um, so whenever you have slipping, you no longer can assume these relationships up here between the angular acceleration and linear acceleration and between the angular velocity and the linear velocity. Okay, and this is the same one except this undergoes slipping and I just did that problem on the fly. All right, moving on to angular momentum. Bear with me here because I am having to reverse everything on the slides and do everything with my left hand because of the fact that the image is mirrored. So the angular momentum is defined as the moment, the cross product between the moment arm and the, um, and the momentum. So here, I have something rotating. If we take a simple case here, I have the moment arm, arm R. I'm going to assume clockwise motion, counterclockwise motion. So then my velocity is in that direction. Uh, and you see it as clockwise. Uh, I see it as counterclockwise. You see it as clockwise. So then I have R cross F is away from me, and that is the angular momentum. And this is useful. So we've, we've drawn analogs before between linear motion and angular motion. So before, we had the force is equal to mass times acceleration and is equal to the time derivative of the momentum. The torque is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration and this is equal to the time derivative of the angular momentum. In the past, we had cases where the external forces were zero and we did momentum, we looked at collisions and did momentum conservation problems. Now we can look at cases where the torque, the external torque is zero. And in that case, we have angular momentum conservation. So that's one of the classes of problems that we're going to see here.
All right. So here, now I have to be a little bit careful. X cross Y is Z. So my, um, my coordinate system to be right-handed, this has to, I have to flip the direction of the Z axis when you look at the mirror image. All right, so now if I do R, so R cross P, I take my palm and line it up with R and I rotate it to be in the direction of P and it points down. And all of my figures are exactly um, the inverse because of the mirror image. So R cross P, do it, practice with me. R cross P is down into the plane. R cross P. And I actually like to rote, move my vectors so this is a little easier. I'm going to draw, I'm going to move P because I can move a vector. A vector doesn't have a position. It just has a direction. R cross P is down. It points in the, um, in this case, in the positive Z direction because I had to switch my axis. All right. So this is applicable in cases, for instance, in outer space where you have clouds of gas and dust that were rotating, and they keep rotating in the absence of any external forces. All right, so now R cross P. So again, I think it's a little easier if I draw, I'm going to shift my This is parallel to the momentum. Um, so I have a proton moving in a circle. R cross P is pointing at U. OK, momentum conservation, angular momentum conservation. So angular momentum is equal to I times omega the same way that so momentum momentum is equal to mass times velocity angular momentum is equal to moment of inertia times angular velocity angular velocity is how fast it's spinning so if i am an ice skater and i spin with my arms out when uh, I, I actually used to be able to do this on the ice and I no longer can. All right, now I am, I understand the theory, but the practice not so much. All right, spin on the ice. I, if, I, if the ice skater pulls her arms in, she is reducing her moment of inertia because the moment of inertia always goes something like the mass times the radius squared. So when the ice skater pulls her arms in, she is reducing the radius of the radius where her mass is located. So spin, pull your arms in, spin, pull the arms in, and then you get um, you you start spinning faster. In the classroom, we have a lovely demo, but there's not an easy way to bring demos in here. Okay, here a rigid body is, so here this is considering what happens more generally. A rigid body is constrained to rotate around the z-axis. What do we mean by a rigid body? A rigid body is just something that doesn't expand, it can't contract, it's not squishy, it's, it's static. And the reason we do that is because as long as it's static, if it's not, it's not changing shape and size, you don't have to worry about what that's doing to the moment of inertia. So a rigid body um, is, it's, in this case, it's symmetrical about the z-axis. So um, what do you, how do you figure out the, the angular momentum? So it's rotating about the z-axis. You would have to add up each of the chunks of masses, 
do an integral, get the moment of inertia. Um, and then you have its, um, in this case, uh, how do you get the, for a given component, you have uh, the, you'd have to consider how much it's rotating, or you can use angular momentum equals I omega. So if you know um, the moment of inertia and how rapidly it is spinning, you can calculate the moment of inertia, the, the angular momentum. Now, if you have a top which is not spinning, and it's at all, so it's symmetric about its axis. If it's slightly misaligned with the z-axis, you know, if it were perfect, it could stand on end forever, but it's unstable because if it even gets slightly off, there is a torque, and that torque acts on the center of moment, uh, the, the center of mass, and it is going to, um, so if you start having the, um, the top spin, it will, so if in the absence of spinning, there's a torque around the, uh, acting at the center of mass, and that's actually going to cause this top to rotate uh, about the origin, or you see it flop down and fall on the floor. So here to have uh, an, a right-handed coordinate system, I have to change the signs so this is the negative direction of the z-axis, the way you see it. All right, R cross F, there is a torque in the x direction, in this case. It is causing the top to rotate or fall towards the floor. Now. In that case, that, that's a little less interesting. But now, let's suppose that we have the top rotating um, roughly about the z-axis. And now you have the same torque from gravity. So now, your center of mass is slightly off from the z-axis. Because angular momentum is conserved, if it is rotating about the z-axis, it wants to stay rotating about the z-axis. So anything that's spinning, so it wants to try to keep spinning to keep angular momentum conserved. Except now you're adding this different torque, and this torque is about a different axis. Um, so when you're spinning, you can also figure out where your angular momentum is when you're spinning by rotating your fingers in the direction of motion and your thumb points in the direction of angular momentum. So if this is spinning like this, then the angular momentum is in the negative z direction. Um, so then um, I am going to apply a torque and we're going to assume that that at the point that the top is totally is in the xz plane, then r cross f is pointing in the in the x direction. So your angular momentum, is, which was in this direction, gets a little kick in the x direction. It's going to cause that angular momentum to rotate in the x direction, and you move a little bit and the kick is going to move a little bit as well. So what you see instead is that that angular momentum vector is now going to process. It's going to rotate around the z-axis because of the torque of the top around the, um, around the, it's not always going to be the x-axis, but it's going to, so when it's in the x, in the y-z plane, it's going to be rotating about the x-axis, when it is in the xz plane, it's going to be rotating about the y-axis. So that you're, um, if this is my angular momentum, r, r cross f, as I rotate, um, my, uh, the change in angular momentum 
due to the torque from gravity is going to rotate as well. So that angular momentum is going to rotate or process. Okay, so this is just another figure showing something similar. Gravity acts on the center of mass and produces a torque, which is um, perpendicular to the angular momentum. The magnitude doesn't, so this, this change in angular momentum does not change the magnitude of the angular momentum, but just the direction. And that word is precess. Here's another example. You have a spinning bike wheel. Um, and so you get the, the bike wheel spinning. Um, and so let's say that it's, so if we look at this picture, it's always a, so it's direction of rotation um, up. I have to switch the signs here. Whoop. Whoop. That doesn't show up very well. It, so you have, uh, instead of rotating, so you're going to get the angular momentum rotating like that, and likewise the angular velocity. Now, you lift, she lifts it with her right hand and pushes down with her left hand um, to try to rotate the wheel. This creates torque pointing towards her, um, which causes the angular momentum to change in the same direction. So the, 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 that would push the wheel towards her. Um, so when you try to rotate like this, when the wheel is spinning, to keep the angular momentum the same, it's going to feel like the wheel is pushing, is pushing on you, and it's pushing, in this case, towards her. Now we're going to move to some examples. So, a yo-yo. Um, when you have a yo-yo, if you draw your If you draw your, um, your free body diagram, uh, assuming that your yo-yo is symmetric, you have the, um, the mass mostly located in the, um, it, the mass should be roughly in the center of mass. And then you have the torque from the tension in the string. So, the, the, so gravity does not create a, a torque, but the tension does. And so you have R cross F into the board. Your torque is into the board. Uh, well, where the way you see it, it's pointing at you. So this is your torque. And then if we write our, um, so this says if the cylinder falls as the string unwinds without slipping, what is the acceleration of the cylinder? So here is a case where we have to write our, um, so we have the force is equal to, let me draw y, x, and then z is pointing towards you. Um, so the force is equal to, mg negative y hat plus tension in the y hat direction. And this is equal to m a center of mass. Um, and we are going to, that has to be in the y hat direction. And it will be positive if it is positive y hat. So we get the, um, when we cancel out our vectors, we're left with a scalar equation, mg plus p equals ma center of mass. Torque is equal to i center of mass, alpha center of mass, which is equal to r cross f, so rt, this is now in the z hat direction, and this 
hats must also be in the Z hat direction. So I, we are left with a scalar equation, I, center of mass, alpha, center of mass, equals R, P. And we also know acceleration of the center of mass is equal to R times alpha, center of mass. So then I'm going to plug this into here. And I get I, center of mass, A, center of mass, equals R squared T, or A, center of mass, equals R squared T divided by I, center of mass. So this has units of 1 over mass, so this is tension, this is force over mass, which indeed has units of acceleration. Now that I have gotten this, I can plug this into here. I could do this a few different ways. Um, this is at, so I could either eliminate the tension or I could eliminate the acceleration. This is asking for the acceleration, so I'm actually going to use P equals I center of mass over R squared A center of mass. And then I have negative mg plus i center of mass over r squared a center of mass equals ma center of mass. Now I can solve this and I get a, well I'm going to put all of my a's on one side. First, so I have M minus I center of mass over R center R squared times A center of mass equals negative MG or A center of mass equals negative G over 1 minus I center of mass over M R squared. Okay, a few things to point out. First of all, when I write it like this, you can see that I have the correct units for the acceleration. Second of all, and here if I set the center of mass equal, the moment of inertia about the center of mass equal to zero, so all of the mass is at, say, a point, then I get back to free fall. That's important because it makes sense that you should just have free fall if, uh, if you don't have any, if you can't cause any rotation. Um, and in that case, if, if there's no moment of inertia, the tension can't actually cause rotation. So it just acts like it's in free fall. Um, this has the correct units by definition. Uh, you know, moment of inertia goes like mr squared. So this is unitless, um, and I can see that any mass that I add, um, and the, the largest moment of inertia is going to be if you put all of the mass out at the edges, and then your moment of inertia is going to be mr squared. So this number is always going to be less than 1, which means that this number is always going to be um, less than 1 as well. So any rotation, less than or equal to 1, any rotation is going to cause this thing to slow down. And that sort of makes sense. Like, that's what you want a yo-yo to do. A yo-yo should go a little bit slower than if you're just dropping it. So again, you see the basic procedure that what we do is we write down our equation for the net force. We write down our equation for the net torque. Do so carefully. Solve. And you can get to you can solve for the acceleration. Now we could, if we were asked, also solve for the tension in the string. And for the, uh, the angular acceleration, those are all related. But since the problem directly asked us to solve for the acceleration, we were lazy and we did not find those other quantities. That actually brings up an important point. You want to be careful when you're, when you're doing your physics homework. Read the problem carefully. 
um, and only answer the question which was asked, especially if you're, on, if you're doing an exam. Be very, try to very carefully only answer the question which was asked because you can end up spending a lot of time answering many questions which were not asked. As they say about carpentry, measure twice, cut once, spend a lot of time reading the problem. A lot of times students are too eager to get on with solving the problem and they would be well advised to spend a little bit more time thinking about the problem first. Especially trying to think about if there's some clever trick. People, students always want to just put pen to paper and then move on. A little thought can save you a long time. Okay, a solid cylindrical wheel of mass M and radius R is pulled by a force F applied to the center of the wheel at 37 degrees to the horizontal. If the wheel is rolling without slipping, what is the maximum value of F? Um, here I've copied and pasted the, the problems, so some of the, um, some of the special characters get a little bit messed up. Okay, same procedure. We are going to start, well, we're going to start by, uh, there's a coordinate system for us. So X, Y, and pointing at U is our Z axis. So we can write net, well, let's start by writing each of our component forces. So weight is negative m g y hat the we have friction or sorry the, the applied force is f cosine theta i'm going to do my usual thing and call this theta f cosine theta x hat plus f sine theta y hat. Normal force is just, we'll leave it as n y hat. Friction, and this is without slipping, so it's static friction, is mu sub s times the normal force, and that's the, let's see, we will just leave this one, actually, since it's static, for, that's the maximum value. We're going to leave this as lowercase f sub s, and it's in the negative x hat direction. Okay, so now our total y force, which has, has to equal zero, because the thing is not flying up off the ground, or at least the, the problem implied that it's not flying up off the ground, it could if that applied force is strong enough and if, it, uh, if it's strong enough that it's, it's larger than gravity. Okay, now we have negative mg plus f sine theta plus n. And all of that is equal to zero. And we know we're going to need n for the... Um, we know we're, this is static friction. We might not actually need N. Let's see. Then we need um, the F, the force in the X direction. So we might not need N because we know that the force in the Y direction is zero. The force in the X direction is going to be F cosine theta minus F sub S. Now we have our torque, and because the applied force is applied only at the center, there's no torque from that force. And because gravity is applied at the center, there is no torque from that force. Because the normal force is parallel to the moment arm, there is no torque from that force. So we only have to consider torque from the um, from friction. And there, the, 
let's see, R cross F is towards me. So R cross, oh no, it's towards you. R cross F is towards you. So we have a net torque, which is I center of mass alpha center of mass, which is equal to F sub S R Z hat. So this has to be in the Z hat direction. That torque is causing this to rotate in the, um, it's causing it to rotate like that. Okay. So then I can write this I center of mass alpha center of mass equals F sub S R equals I center of mass alpha center of mass over R. And then I can solve this equation to get F sub S. Ah, actually, this should be A center of mass. F sub S equals I center of mass over R squared, A center of mass. So now this has units of mass, this has units of acceleration, and that, should, that has units of force. We're good. Okay, then I can plug this back in. F sub X equals F cosine theta minus, and this is m a center of mass. Ah, so here I can solve that the solve for the center uh, acceleration about the center of mass is equal to let's see here I am going to write this as M let's see I'm going to put the M there and then this is 1 plus I center of mass over M R squared equals F cosine theta or A center of mass equals F over M cosine theta over 1 plus I center of mass M R squared. Okay, now that tells me what the acceleration was. Here's where do as I say, not as I do. The problem asks for the maximum value of F if the coefficient, uh, given the coefficient of static friction. So the maximum coefficient of static, so the maximum value of F sub S is going to be F cosine theta minus mu sub S, ah, and here I need this N. Here, N is going to be equal to M G minus F sine theta. So my maximum value of F sub S is this as M G minus F sine theta Okay, I need for that, I cannot have this, 
I cannot have anything, any greater acceleration than this. So my acceleration has to equal here a center of mass equals r squared f sub s i center of mass no, no, over i center of mass and i can write plug this in here r squared over i center of mass now i have mu sub s m g minus f sine theta i may not have solved this in the most efficient manner f cosine theta then equals m r squared over i center of mass plus one quantity m let's see mu sub s m G minus F sine theta. Here, I'm going to go ahead and leave it as an exercise for the student. You put your Fs on this side, and then solve, you'll end up with some ugly term with sines and cosines, and divide through by that constant term in terms of the Fs, and there's probably sufficient simplifications. So the basic idea, regardless, is that you write your net, you draw your force diagram just like we did before. You can calculate your net force. Um, well, draw your coordinate system, calculate your net force, calculate your net torque. This is going to involve thinking about which forces actually can generate a torque about the um, the axis of rotation, um, and then when you have those equations, you, without slipping, you can, can use the fact that the angular acceleration is related to the angular, is related to the um, linear acceleration, and same for angular velocity, and then just plug along. So this is where solving the, um, solving the algebraic equations often is a lot of ugly math, but not hard conceptually. And the place that trips students up most often is that they will set up the equations incorrectly. And if you set up the equations incorrectly, it doesn't matter how well you do things after that, your answer is still going to be wrong. So spend a lot of time setting up those equations. OK, use the right-hand rule to de determine the directions of the angular momenta about the origin of the particles as shown above. So this first one, this is R, R cross F, it, 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 or sorry, R cross P, this is pointing towards me. Here, this is R, the R is, perpendic is parallel to the momentum, so the cross product is zero. This is R. R is parallel to the momentum, so the cross product is zero. This is R. R cross F is pointing towards you. Now, as much trouble as I am having with the right hand rule, because I'm have to, having to use my left hand because it's the mirror image, I expect you to have at least that much trouble learning the right-hand rule. That's why it's very important to practice. 
A particle of mass m is dropped at a point d and falls vertically in Earth's gravitational field. What is the expression for the angular momentum of the particle around the z-axis, which points directly out of the page? We're actually going to, yeah, it's pointing towards, so x cross y, it's pointing towards u. So z is in that direction, point it towards u. Okay, so now we can write the position if we have free fall, the, um, the y position as a function of time is going to be the initial y position, which is 0, plus the initial y velocity, which is 0, times time, plus 1 half times the acceleration, which is negative g, times time squared. So our y position as a function of time is negative gt squared. Our x position, also as a function of time, but there's no time dependence, is negative d. So I can write that the position of this particle at all times is negative d x hat plus, well, plus a negative one half g t squared y hat. And then I want to know the, um, the angular momentum of the particle about the z axis. So I'm going to use angular momentum equals r cross t equals m r cross z. My velocity as a function of time is the time derivative of my position. So my velocity is negative g t y hat. I also could solve that using my kinematic equations if you're not too comfortable just yet with taking derivatives. So negative g t y hat and now I have the angular momentum is m r cross v. y hat cross y hat is 0, so the only contribution I have is from x hat cross y hat. x hat cross y hat is z hat. And I have two negative signs there. They're going to cancel each other out, and I am left with m d g t z hat so it will cause a so the the velocity is always going to be in that direction r cross p r cross p is going to point towards you it's always going to be in the z hat direction so there's a few ways you could do this. You could figure out um, the magnitude, or you could, by looking at the picture and going, okay, well, I know that the y component is never gonna, um, never gonna, the y component of the, um, of the position is never gonna contribute. So I'm always gonna have just the x component. You could do it with unit vectors. You could draw some picture at some later time to help you figure it out. Choose your poison. It often helps with the, sometimes these simple problems can seem like they're really tricky. I recommend starting by writing down the basic equations that you know um, and 
and often you'll see something that's going to work. Okay. An Earth satellite has its apogee at 250 kilometers above the surface of the Earth and its perigee at 500 kilometers above the, um, above the surface of the Earth. Its speed at its apogee is 6,260 meters per second. What is its speed at perigee? Okay, so here what matters is the, the first, the tricky part is the definition of the terms. So apogee is this distance as indicated by the R sub A on the figure. Perigee is this shorter distance. In both cases, the, uh, the momentum is, um, is perpendicular to the, um, to the moment arm. So we have angular momentum. And here I'm going, I'm going to drop the, um, the vector because we're only worried about the magnitude of the angular momentum. The direction is not changing. So the magnitude of the angular momentum is R times the magnitude of the momentum. So M, oh, there's a capital M in this problem. M, V, so the mass, R perigee, or V perigee equals mass, R apogee, V apogee, angular momentum conservation. So it asks, um, what is its speed at, uh, at perigee? So the speed at perigee is equal to the radius at apogee over the radius at perigee times the speed at apogee, or 2,500 kilometers over 500 kilometers times, oh, sorry, this is above the surface of the Earth. So here, because the surface of the Earth is actually quite significant, so this is our Earth plus the distance at apogee over our Earth plus the distance at perigee times the velocity at apogee. All right, I'm going to leave it as an exercise for the student to plug those numbers in now that we've left the equation up. And I want to point out the importance of reading the problem carefully. Notice how I got tripped up because I was using that radi the, the distance is given as the actual radii, but the distance of the, the radius of the Earth actually is significant compared to the radii. Notice here, the radius of the Earth is 6,370 kilometers. That's huge. Okay. Shown below is a, so shown above is a small mass, a particle of mass 20 grams that is moving at a speed of 10 meters per second. Uh, when it collides and sticks to the edge of a uniform solid cylinder. The cylinder is free to rotate about its axis through its center and is, perpendic and is perpendicular to the page. The cylinder has a mass of 5 kilograms and a radius of, point, uh, a radius of 10 centimeters and is initially at rest. What is the angular velocity of the system before the collision and how much kinetic energy is lost in the, in the collision? Okay, the fact that you're told that the, um, well, you're told that there's energy lost, so you cannot use energy conservation. You can use angular, um, you can use angular, um, you, you can use moment, angular momentum conservation. Okay, so before the, the collision, just before you have the particle at R, uh, uh, the moment arm is R. It has 
this we'll call little mass m, this is big mass m, and uh, then your initial angular momentum Let me drop the vector because we're only worried about, we don't have the sign changing, so we don't have the direction changing, so we're just going to worry about scalars. The angular momentum is m r v initial, the final angular momentum is I omega, and so what is the angular velocity of the system after the collision? We have to write out I. This is I of the cylinder plus m r squared because the mass sticks to the edge of the cylinder. Um, and we haven't said yet, well, the problem didn't specify what the moment of inertia of the cylinder was. You can assume uniform, you could assume uniform, but I'm going to leave this plugged in as is. So, so far, um, and you have M R V initial equals I cylinder plus M r squared omega omega equals m r v i over i cylinder plus m r squared. I'm going to divide through on top and bottom by m r squared. And I get V sub I over R divided by 1 plus I cylinder over little m R squared. So uh, in this particular problem, the cylinder has a mass of 5 kilograms. That's probably going to be the dominant mass. Um, let's see, the radius, let's use, let's assume a uniform cylinder. If we assume a uniform cylinder, then uh, that moment of inertia is one half m r squared. And then we get omega equals 10 meters per second divided by so it has a radius of 10 centimeters so divided so we're going to actually we're going to use 0.1 meters and this is this 1 plus i cylinder over m r squared is 1 plus 1 half times 0.5 kilograms times 0.1 squared, so 10 to the negative 2 meters squared over 2 times 10 to the negative 2 kilograms times 10 to the negative 2 meters squared. I could have canceled the R's out here. And I'm left with 1 quarter divided by 2 to the negative 2. So I have uh, 1 over 4 
times 2 times 10 to the 2. So I have 100 divided by 8 plus 1. The 1 doesn't matter. The big thing is that this moment of inertia is a lot bigger than the moment of inertia from the little tiny particle. 100 divided by 8, 25 divided by 2, or 12.5, so this is 13.5, and I dropped, uh, ah, yes, I dropped my units because I don't actually have units um, on this. So this is divided by 12.5. This is 100 divided by 12.5, uh, 100 inverse seconds, and that is 8 inverse seconds. Okay, how much kinetic energy is lost in the collision? I will set that up, but I'm going to leave it as an exercise for the student. So what you would have to use in that case is that the initial velocity, or the initial kinetic energy is one half mv squared, and the final kinetic energy is one half i, center of mass, omega squared. So now we have omega, um, we have the uh, the moment of inertia of the final system, which is right here. Um, and you can calculate the, the ratio of the initial energy to the, of the final energy to the initial energy. All right. So we will do this, set up this last problem, but um, I'm going to leave this one as well as an exercise for the student. Twin skaters approach one another and lock hands. Calculate their final angular velocity given that each had an initial speed of 2 meters per second relative to the ice. Um, each has a mass of 70 kilogram and grams and each has a center of mass located 0.8 meters from their locked hands. Um, so you may estimate them as their moment of inertia as that of a point mass located at their locked hands. So you can do the same thing um, that we did in the last problem and set it up as a conservation of angular momentum problem. Now you have to figure out their initial angular momentum right before they lock hands. So the angular momentum of one of them is m r v, and you've got two of them that are exactly identical. Well, it doesn't say they were identical twins, but we're going to assume that that's what the problem meant. And now um, this is equal to i omega. Um, this is going to be, uh, their moment of inertia is going to be twice their mass, because there's two of them, times the radius squared. So you have, this is the moment of inertia. And then you can calculate that the angular velocity is, um, let me double check, it was asking for, the, um, it was, if it's asking for the angular velocity, the angular velocity is, here we have the MRs cancel out to, we'll write this, 2MRV over 2MR squared, and you end up with V over R equals the angular velocity. All right, so that gives you a few different types of problems to consider where you either have force and um, 
you have you have to consider torque and net torque and net force, draw a free body diagram, figure out what the what the system is doing, or you have uh, um, you can use angular momentum. So we're slowly building up your toolkit so that you um, you can solve figure out what's going in most problems going on physically. And with that, we're going to end this one, and I'll see you next time.